Miss Clay, Curtin is in one minute. Please make your way back to Yes, thank you. All right. So here we are at show number 70 of the amazing Dana Clay's 70 City North American Tour. And once this last concert's finally over, so am I. In every way. You'd think someone, my agent, my manager, my band, might have picked up on this. Like maybe from my current single, Hello, the album's title track, I wrote that song as a suicide note. But no, every time I sing it, every time it comes on the radio, every time that music video plays, all they hear is their next big must maker. Stratocaster and stepped spotlight up to the mic. 
Thanks. Last encore, last song. Dana ran her left hand through her hair and peered out at the vast sea of bands raging before her. Glancing down, she met the gaze of a boy half her age, standing just below, palms pressed against the barricade that, along with a handful of security guards, separated audience from stage. He had spent the concert watching her fingers, studying her fretwork, a budding guitarist, no doubt, but now stared worshipfully into Dana's eyes. She looked away. I guess you all know this one. I'm kind of sick of it myself, but I remember when it still... Still does, Dana! The crowd applauded and cheered in assent. Yeah, lucky you. With that, she unleashed the anticipated opening chord. To Dana, the crowd's replying roar had grown near meaningless with nightly repetition. The mob began moving with the music, and then the band kicked in, pushing the audience into an exhilaration bordering on frenzy. Spotlights and lasers bobbed and weaved, sweeping the stage with abandon. Each time two beefs crossed paths at the center, Dana, head bowed, hammering away, seemed pinned at their intersection. Behind her, bruised purple strobes flashed and pulsed as her head rose, eyes clamped tight, and then her voice a searing, unsettling control to a rich and darkly radiant sound seized the room with its familiar words of defiant accusation. The bass drum pounded menacingly, each beat reverberating right behind her ribs as Dana delivered her unflinching account of childhood trauma and torment. A multitude of voices joined her as she reached the chorus. Your virtue will virtue, your make-believe so. Took vicious advantage in taking their toll. Your counterfeit conscience, your replica heart, can wear me and tear me, but never part. Dana's gaze fell again on the boy below, who now looked up. He and the singer locked eyes. Do you play? After a stunned moment, the boy nodded. Dana stuck her pick between her teeth, dropped to one knee, and extended her right hand. The boy ducked under the barrier to grab her forearm. Dana turned to the approaching guards. It's okay. And hoisted her young fan on stage. Still playing, her band watched this unprecedented scene with curiosity and some concern. Two more kids tried to follow, but were dissuaded. Standing there beside Dana, the slight boy with shoulder-length reddish-brown hair could almost have been her twin but in contrast to the singer's all-black garb. The boy wore a white tee with a photo of his idol's face on the front. Dana removed her guitar and slung its strap over his head, blotting out her own image with her instrument. She offered her pick. He took it and located the right minor chord. Then all at once, he was playing the song that, back home with his own off-brand guitar, he had played so many times while envisioning himself backed up by just such a band, on just such a stage, before just such a audience. The enormity of it would have overwhelmed him if he'd stopped the thing, but he didn't. He just strummed. And then as Dana pushed him forward, he stepped up to the mic and heard his own voice booming from the monitors. The boys sang fairly well, and by mid-verse, most everyone below was either cheering or singing along. Though dwarfed by the crowd, the boy felt Colossal. He had never known such strength or self-assurance, such runaway joy. From his vantage point, he saw the entire audience from which he had emerged. They, in turn, saw what the boy alone could not. The small female figure behind him turning to slip past the drums, drop into the shadows, and proceed from sight. <laughs> You 
a photocopied flyer showing up on restaurant bulletin boards and community kiosks and drugstore walls and in between restroom sinks. Tess, all is forgiven. Your family needs you back. Come home now. There's a song in that poster for someone out there to write. And this, this Tess chick my fellow fugitive. Well, for starters, she's she's freaking cute. I wouldn't mind running into her. Jeez, poor thing. I'd have some words for her first. A, a little advice on how to deal with whatever dick out there is so bound and determined to keep her under his thumb.
Eventually, Dana finds herself driving, quite by chance, into the midst of the silent, sawtoothed peaks, shadowy chasms, and towering spires of the South Dakota Badlands. She finds a cheap motel, checks in, and sets out to explore the singularly strange land around her. She starts by hiking, but then begins to climb the Badlands formations, a challenge she faces, then enjoys, then revels in. I can, I can do this. I can actually do something. And yet, a week after her arrival, I can't do anything. Dana hastens back to the motel and collapses in the middle of her bed. I'm sorry, everyone, for everything. God, I'm sorry. She burrows under the covers, then turns off the bedside lamp, plunging her room, bed, and body into the same darkness that fills her heart. She sees her future spread out like a minefield before her. Her songwriting block means... I'll never compose again. The hollowness she feels while performing means... My music is shit. Soon the critics will expose me for the, the fake, the sham that I am. Her chronic fatigue means... A tumor, a cancer somewhere within me is sucking up all my strength. As for her last lover, her former drummer, his parting words prove that even if Dana lives... I'll spend my whole life alone. She longs for sleep as for another person. A soulmate. The harder she wishes, the more painful the void. At daybreak, finally she sleeps, but after two hours of tortuous dreams, she wakes up exhausted. God, it's like I haven't slept at all. A new day, but just more of the same. Dana lies staring at the clock radio, watching time crawl by and cringes at the mocking sliver of sunshine that's forced its way in between the curtains into her stale brown cell of a room. If I could get up just for a moment, go over and, and pull those curtains closed, blot it out! But she can't, for she is afraid to move. Mid-afternoon, lying now on her stomach, she is transported back in time to relive pain for pain, shame for shame, the most hideous moments of her shattered life. Into her damp pillow, Dana, Dana croaks out her plea. No, oh God, oh please, just no! Her head swims, for she is drunk again on the peppermint schnapps he has given her. The sickly sweet taste of it in my mouth. The knuckles of her fist clenched between her teeth. My left fist, left fist, mine! While the pillar of hate that is him, him presses, grinds, and pounds her into the mattress as he batters his way into her, into the torn raw core of her, into this. Tattered shell that's me, and I just can't flee. An eternity later, the flashback ends, leaving Dana beaten down, shaking, furious. With God, with fate, with mom, with mom's so called boyfriend, and with me. Is this my reward for facing my demons? For my unwillingness to sugarcoat? My lifelong refusal to self censor or suppress? She longs to be like those with repressed memories who've been granted, at least consciously, some sanctuary. She is jealous of the ignorant, the clueless, the oblivious. She envies the cataleptic, the comatose. The dead. Then, instantly, at 3.03 p.m., as if by the flip of a tiny toggle in the center of her head. It's over. Somehow, for now at least, it's over. Dana sits up and wipes off her cheeks. She stands, adds over to the sink, and splashes cool water onto her face. Then wiping her hands, she glances down and spots something. What's that? Is that a, a plant growing out of the floor? A lone weed, half the height of her thumb, is poking up between two of the floorboards. Just a scrawny green stem, not a single leaf. <laughs> what's it? What's it doing here? Alone in my room, okay. my motel room. Uh, I see a tiny this weed, uh, but there's a short, short little plant. Yeah, that's killer, Clay. Really fucking poetic. What's 
the use.
silent and intent. Data makes her way up the tallest Badland formation in sight, a massive mountain of earth and clay that undermines her every expectation. Geez, from below that looked like a straightaway, but it's, it's led me straight to this chasm. With a running start, I could jump it, well, with luck, but how stable is the other side? With luck. She is not feeling lucky. Hasn't in quite some time. But I've climbed this high. No way am I turning back now. So instead, she ascends a steep ridge to the right. Dana climbs as well. She is light and lithe, both of which help. More crucially, though, she has a keen climber's eye, a natural talent for spotting and then seeking each opportunity. This handhold, it'll hold. This ledge, it won't dislodge. It'll endure. This foothold, it'll bear my full weight. She catches herself. Her misstep sends a lucid fragment bumpily tumbling all the way down. It's a hell of a long way to the bottom. But it's okay. She has begun to grow in confidence to understand... Less with my mind than with my arms and legs, my flesh, muscle, and bone. ...that she is not going to fall. For better or worse, I am this body, and this body seems to know what it's doing. So she picks up her pace and reaches in time a flat stretch that slopes up to a gently concave cliff with a tier of cumulus clouds hovering beyond. This must be it. I've reached the top. I guess I lost track of just how far I climbed. Now it's like I'm at the edge of the world. Dana steps up to the very brink and looks down. Far, far below, the white river snakes serenely through a blush valley dotted with cottonwoods and ash. There to the north. A herd of bison. There to the east. A pair of horses side by side on a sunny field. There in between. A vacant dirt road wending its way to nowhere. Dana stands there and gazes out, down, all around. She watches the clouds crawl by, watches their shadows creep over the prairie. It is a breathtaking sight. And it would make a breathtaking place to breathe my last. It is tempting, because it would be so easy to just step off and then drop down, down, swiftly reversing the laborious ascent and then meet the ground from which she started and let it erase in an instant all of her pain. No more screwed up attempts. A fall from this height would do the trick. Plus I'd be out here, in the air, on the land, in the light. A half step forward, the toes of her boots now poking over the edge. How she has hoped, longed, pined for deliverance and it seemed like her wish was maybe being granted, like the land might deliver her if she could stay put and take it all in. That I could do, could even embrace. But to start on medication, to alter her mind. That was what he did to me, used booze to cloud my brain in order to take my body. She hasn't had a drink since, let alone anything stronger, despite her otherwise typical rock and roll lifestyle. It's simple self-defense. Keep your head Pure, lest your body be contaminated again. Keep your mind clean, because it, that mind of mine, it's all I've got left. But where is it now? Each time Dana feels she's reached a breaking point, she somehow manages to plod on, if not persevere. But how much more can I take? Isn't there a limit to how far a person can bend without breaking? Wear me and tear me, but never apart! Isn't that just a life sentence? Closes her eyes, teeters on the edge as the wind whistles in her ears. It swirls, it curls, currents and cross currents buffering her from all directions. A single step is all it takes. Gusts from her left, her right, from both sides squeezing, from the front, the right, the back and left at once. One step that will save me so many others. Wind from behind her, then from the right, then the left, then from the front. One tiny step that will cure me, solve everything! Gusts from her left, then from the front, still from the front, from the front only. Wind from the front, harder now, even harder, pushing and prodding her from the front, urging her back, back away from the edge. Digging her heels in, Dana stands her ground, equally afraid to step forward or back. To die or live. And so vows to wait the wind out and choose her answer. Then it occurs to her, 
the wind itself might be giving me an answer. So she backtracks one, two, three paces. The cool gust in her face subsiding a bit with each step. The wind dying down now because I'm lower now, less exposed, or sounds crazy, but because I just did as the wind asked. She gazes ahead, far off into the distance, as if to a future that, till a moment ago, she knew she would never live to see. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll look into medication. I'll find a doctor in town and try to be open. Give myself a fighting chance. Dana turns and walks away from the cliff edge. Then she takes a deep breath and begins the long, slow trek back down to solid ground. Yes, thank you, Doctor. I, I got the prescription filled. Yep, right there at Wall Drug. They took the first pill right in front of their life-size roaring T-Rex. Gotta say, that was, that was quite a way to start on psych meds. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll see you in, in two weeks. It was nice to meet you, too. Uh, yes, I will call him. Yes. Now. Right now. Okay. Bye-bye. Help you? Let's find out. Thank you, pardon? Hello. Oh, hello. Um, Mr. Drake? All except Mr. Abbas Drake. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm a patient of Dr. Eaton? Oh, it's Ed Eaton out in Wall. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he, he gave me your number. He suggested I call you. He, he gave me directions to your ranch. So, Doc Eaton, he, he kind of prescribed me for you, did he? <laughs> well, that's fine. You, you come out and visit anytime. Come out now if you like. Oh, okay. Um, but, sorry, but who... Who, what, what are you, a, a therapist, a, a shrink, or a... I'm a stuntman. A stuntman? Retired. See you soon. A stunt, a stuntman? So I, I drove right over and met him. This Drake is a real-life cowboy. Tall, dark, not bad looking for an old guy. If there was a Drake Jr., he would totally be my type. Well, one of my types. When you're into men and women, you have a lot of types. Make up your mind, Dana. Anyway, Drake took me out horseback riding, and we talked. He's a depression survivor. Kind of a smart ass, too, at times. But uh, I think he's giving me good advice. He must be. I've been back there twice. I think the meds are helping, too. I've been on them for two and a half weeks now. I've also been out hiking and climbing a lot on my own. I don't even take my phone with me. I guess you could say I've gone off the grid. I'm not my old self anymore. As for my new self, I'm kind of a work in progress. Well, thanks for having me over again, Drake. This, this dinner's delicious. You know, if you like it now, just wait until you try a second bite at some point. <laughs> I was was wrong with you. So I'm out hiking today, right? And I, I get to the loop road, oh. and uh, I see what looks like a, a molted snake skin, right? In the middle of the, the southbound lane, a, a rattlesnake skin, a big one too, about as long as I am tall. And I'm getting closer and closer, and I see, uh, I see it's got, uh, I, I see it's a real life snake, not a skin. So you stopped uh, getting closer and closer. Right. Yeah. But I kept on looking, and, um, and I see there's a swelling about halfway down its length. Yeah, some cottontail or prairie dog probably ventured into the wrong place at the wrong time. And now the snake is doing the same thing, because it's just a matter of time before some semi or pickup comes around the bend, and that'll be that. Well, it's true that that whole concept of roadway, a little bit beyond the typical rattlesnake's uh, intellectual capacity. <laughs> Snakes just lying there basking in the sun, and the only thing that could possibly prevent it from getting squashed was... Oh, Lord, no. So, <laughs> so, so I, I broke off a bunch of big hardened mud clumps from this mound over at the side of the road, and I, I kind of pulled them out of, out of the rattler, and he didn't start rattling at me, or thank God start slithering toward me. Yeah, it probably didn't even connect you with that uh, 
horizontal avalanche he's perpetrated. Nice. Anyway, it worked. It took a while, but it worked. It, the rattler finally uh, slithered off into the brush at the far side of the road. And, and when it did, Drake, I, I felt this elation. I mean, I was almost giddy. Because you'd saved the life. Right? A lethal predator's life. Huh? Right. Right. I mean, what if that snake bites some clueless tourist or or some Lakota child, or that, that runaway mom from the posters, that Tess, or her baby. All right, clueless tourists, really no problem. The other ones, it, it's just kind of, you're letting your imagination run away with yourself. But the blood would be on my hands. That's true, and the venom in the blood too. <laughs> exactly. To be honest, the whole thing sent me into kind of a spiritual crisis. <laughs> Oh, you just can't win for losing, girl, can you? <laughs> Always my pleasure to entertain. I'm oh, sorry, I'm oh, sorry. You know, if you like, we could go up, head out there in the morning and try and hunt that bugger down. Uh, of course, now, that rather may have a nest somewhere, eggs to tempt. You wouldn't want to make orphans out of all them poor little snake babies. Leave them to grow up all alone Drink. in a cold, Drink. cruel world. Drink. Without the parentage or supervision of any man. Drake, would yeah. you please try to take this seriously? Because honestly, it, it bothers me. And I really want, I want to, I need to know if I did the right thing. Right thing. Hmm. Oh, you're occupying something of a gray area there, huh, right? Well, would you have done it? Or no. One less rattlesnake around these parts, no skin off my nose. But that don't make what you did wrong. Tell me something. <sighs> about the god dang snake. No, about depression. You, you, you told me after your wife died. Well, that's what did it, all right. I've been there. Been there and back. That's what I'm wondering. Does it ever really go away? I mean, for good. Well... For the most part, uh, at least it did for me, and thank God for that. I think I told you about my daughter, Kayla, just a few years younger than you. Right, I want to meet her. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you will. Anyway, uh, she was mourning too, of course. Uh, at, at, at the worst possible time, her dad was not really there for her. He was away. But that dad of hers, he came back. So the depression does go away. Yeah, like I say, for the most part. It's like, you always know it's still there, though. Imagine a, a map, and then there's a road off the side of it. It's not on the map, but if the map did extend that far... Gotcha, it's on the periphery. Right, right. It, you feel like yourself. Uh, messages are getting sent, and the connections in here are getting made. But you know deep down... It could change any day, right? Which is... Maybe a good thing. It keeps you grateful. It keeps you in check. You know what's funny? Back in my stuntman days, I must have broke 50, 60 bones, some of them more than once. Not to mention collecting all manner of burns, bumps, bruises, dislocations, lacerations, eviscerations. I believe there was one decapitation. But look, I'm still walking. I have even been known to two-step now and again. That human body is also resilient. But the mind, that's like fine china. You got to take care. So, take care, girl. You know, I, I hope you don't mind me giving her all this kind of fatherly advice. No, it's, it's a big help. Besides, you're the closest thing to a father that I've got right now. It's my honor. But mind you, Sure as hell ain't no father in the clergy sense, so as for that spiritual crisis of yours, uh, you know, there is a little church in town some folks around here like. They may be able to uh, address your spiritual needs there. I'm not really a church going tight. Eh, me neither. But who knows? Uh, I'll. Oh, what the hell? I'll go check out the goddamn church. Uh, stop by this Sunday. Oh, you can take Kayla's motorbike if you Badass. Yeah, she painted it all red and black. She calls it Harley Quinn for some reason. I like her already. 
Well, you'll spot the place easy as pie. Oh, pie. Uh, yeah, that church, it has a, a marquee out front that says, Made in His Image. Whatever the hell that means, I never got that whole business anyway. And besides, what's with the his? Like, <laughs> like God's a dude. Right, uh, I got you. you know, Kayla, she kind of evolved me on all that sort of thing, uh, as daughters these days are wont to do. And she evolved me on some other things, too. Love is love, Dad. I, I get it. I get it. Kayla, she's uh, she's great. She's a little different. But she's, uh, she's my daughter. She's my only child. End of story. Because that's all that matters. You're right. She's right. You know, I, I know you think it's silly, but I keep coming back to that stupid snake. Look. You saved a life, right? Right. Life, I suppose, is probably grateful. Why not just look at it like that? Coyote? No, oh, it's Jack. <laughs> <laughs>
such criticism. She found herself wondering whether her detractors on one side or the other might be right.
know it ends right up there. So Kayla, do you have like a boyfriend? <laughs> no. Uh, no. No, I don't. You? Not at the moment, no. And I don't have a girlfriend either. Me neither. Wouldn't mind it though. Me neither. Oh God, I totally forgot. I, I gotta go, I'm late. Oh. I gotta get to work. Oh, I'll see ya. Bye. Uh, oh right, her work. I haven't even told you the coolest thing about her. So there's this local TV station, right? And Kayla is the hostess for their late night creature feature show. They, they screen old, old monster movies, horror movies, you know, Dracula, Frankenstein, The Mummy, The Wolfman. I drove up to Rapid City yesterday for the taping. It's amazing. So she's got the black eyeliner, the black lipstick, the gloves, the gown, the cape, the works. She says the pay is so-so, but it's really good exposure for an aspiring actress like her. And um, they even let her come up with her own lines and write her own routines. Well, up to a point. There is one little catch. You see, the station is owned by fundamentalist Christians. And Kayla says these folks really put the fun in fundamentalist. Brad, the director, he's a hoot. He's, he's all like... Be sensuous, Miss Drake. But, but not sexual. You hear me? And, and, and get ready, because we're about to go live. Be sensuous, but not sexual. And I'm not looking. I know you're getting dressed. No bare flesh below the neck. Right? Right. Just right. Thank you. Now, places. Quiet on the set. Miss Drake in position. And action.
Hey, Tay. Yeah, I just had to make a pit stop. I'm currently in the oh so posh powder room at your your local vet's woe and go gas station and convenience store. Oh, shit. Hello, are you there? Yeah, this is not a good time. Uh, I'll be there soon. I'm on my way. Just chill. Okay, bye. That was a little harsh. What was that about? Come on, Clay, you know exactly what that was about. You've seen her a few times, and it's going well, so that's your cue to start completely, royally, fucking up. No, not this time. Oh, oh, sorry. Is that you, Dana Clay? One from my favorite non-country singer. <laughs> and you, you, you're my favorite runaway mom. You're, you're Tess. I, I'm sorry, I've, just, I've been seeing those posters for weeks and weeks now. You've been on the run a long time. So you. Fair enough. Oh, hi, hi, cutie. Uh, Tess, what made you leave? Oh, I've gone into all the gory deeds. Well, when life ain't working, ain't been working for a long while, comes the time you gotta trade her in for a new model. <laughs> Of course, if need be, you can always trade back, right? I'm not saying my man deserves a second chance, but I just may give him one anyway. Emphasis on one. My story is pretty much the same. Just substitute job for man, as in should I go back and try to reclaim my career or just like, you know, die on the vine? Girlfriend, your career's alive and kicking. Seeing you on the entertainment tonight just last night. Yeah, that, that Oblivion album of yours. It's shot up to, I think it's number two on the charts. Oh, and that Jimmy Kimmel, he's making jokes about you like the still missing singer has been spotted, hold up in a cave in Saskatoon with a Sasquatch, <laughs> or some such. You see, no one knows where in creation you are. That's called mystique. <laughs> Shit, I had no idea. So I, I, could, I could go back and be bigger than ever. But should I? Or should I just stay put and try to keep on healing? I don't have a clue which way to go. Golly, me neither. Listen, sister, I really gotta run, as always. But I'll surely keep you in my prayers. Oh, yeah, I don't really prayers. So. I, I, I'll keep you in my prayers too. I, uh, I, 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 and I'll write a song about you. Well, I'll try to anyway. Number two in the chart. I could do it. I could. But I'd, I'd do it different this time. I, I'd take everything I've learned out here and, and, and bring it back into my life, into my, into my career. Imagine the, the splash I'd make just by going back. Unless it, like, sets me back. Kayla? Kayla, I'm not, I'm not coming today. I, I, I need to, I'm gonna turn around and go back. To the Badlands, I mean. I, I need, I have some things I need to work out. I, I need to go on a, a nice long off-trail hike. No, please don't call. I'm, I'm not even gonna take my phone with me. I, I can't listen to anyone else right now. Not you or anyone else. I'm, I'm trying to find my own voice. Kayla, I, Kayla, I have to, I have to go. I'll, I'll call you tomorrow or the day after. Space. I need space. And I need to give Kayla space, too. Of course, she didn't ask for any. Because she's so young, so trusting. She hasn't picked up on it yet on the, the Great Wall of Dana. Although now, well, maybe now she's starting to. I bring so much baggage to everything, everyone I touch. Kayla doesn't need that. And what if I left her, moved home, went back on tour, came back to see her, what, once in a blue moon? That's just the worst, that's limbo. I mean, what were we even thinking? Sun's almost set, but I haven't figured out a fucking thing. I can't go back. Not yet. It looks like there's there's maybe a little a little cave way up at the summit. Yeah, I can I can see the 
opening from here. I'll climb up and sleep there tonight. And as tired as I am, I bet tonight I'll sleep really well.
not going to ask you to get me out of here, out of this endless rain, all the way back down to the ground and back to civilization. I put myself here so it's up to me to get me out. But, but if I, if I lose myself again, lose my wits, lose my resolve, lose my mind, then I won't have a chance. So what I'm asking for is, look, I don't know how you operate, how you decide, how and when and, and where to step in, if, if you step in at all, but, but if, if you could see fit to help me stay sane, I'd really, I, I, I'd appreciate it. And, and that's all I'm going to ask for. Amen. Calling me. 
Is that what I said? Is that what I did, what I had to do in order to survive? I've done it ever since and I'm still doing it. No one will, no one, no. That's bullshit. I'm not 12 years old anymore, I'm 20 fucking seven. No more restrictions, no more walls. I'm not gonna stand in my own way. Not anymore. My body is, is still trapped up here and it's, it's running out of time, but the rest of me, no matter what happens now, whether I live, whether I die, I'm free. Day. Day four. I wake up with a dozen new songs in my head. Like, like, like this one. The, the plant growing out of the floor in the motel room. Right, right, yes, yes. It's better. It's, and all these, and all these other new songs too. Oh my god, they don't all totally suck. I, is, is that the sun? I almost forgot what it looked like, what it felt like. I've got to get back. I've got to get back to Drake, get to, back to Kayla, get back to, to Earth. But I feel so weak, kind of dizzy. Uh, the ground up here is still more mud than dirt. It won't dry out for another two or three more days, but I don't have two or three more days, do I? I'll be even weaker. But if I try to climb down now and I slip and fall, I'd I wonder what Drake would advise. You're occupying kind of a gray area, ain't you? Well, tell you what, girl. Go ahead and save another life, your own. And I reckon that life, life would be grateful. He's right. Life finds a way, or else it doesn't. I might not make it, but I've got to try. It's now or never. It's now.
Jesus Christ gave nice advice, but how can we begin?
thank you for supporting this project. We'll see you at the merch table in about 10 minutes. And thank you to City Winery. You know, this has long been my favorite music venue in Chicago, bar none. I do not say that about other places. Just about City Winery, and it's not just because they cater to people roughly my age with a lot of great groups from the 80s. <laughs> it's also because it's great wine and great, uh, uh, just, I mean, this is like Tony stuff, man. This is perfect place to perform live in every way and it's a dream come true to be here and to be able to do it for these causes and with the fine people who um, who, who supported them is, is an absolute thrill. Uh, I'm going to be seeing Tori uh, next week and we will give her your regards. Uh, thank you for helping her to help victims become survivors. Victim, victims must become survivors and believe victims, believe survivors. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I see how you struggle, you strain and you strive. I watch how you fight for your chance to survive. And I see this flower in me, I'll make it through. You're gonna 